continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today has joined me quite frequently at this table over the past dozen years, though not often enough, I must say, to satisfy my own need for him to share his always compelling insights into what makes us all tick and how we might tick better and more wisely. Long ago dubbed one of America's most interesting psychologists, whose concept of multiple intelligences has provided such an insight into and guide for the educative process. Howard Gardner is Hobbes Professor of Cognition and Education at Harvard University. Now, Basic Books has just published Dr. Gardner's Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed, Educating for the Virtues in the 21st Century. Of course, I realized as I read this quite compelling attack on determinism with its insistence that human agency matters enormously, that today I must first ask my friend whether his new book isn't in a most fundamental sense a sort of would-be antidote to the despair he and his colleagues in Harvard's famous Good Work Project must have felt in their discoveries about what really motivates so many of today's professional workers. Fair or not, Howard? It is true that for 15 years, uh, my colleagues and I have been studying what we call good work, and it's a study of what happens to professions when they're under huge pressure from market forces, whether it's law, journalism, philanthropy, even the clergy, um, when accountability and profit and loss and degree of visibility become the dominating motivations for professions, then the kind of thing which I respect, namely professions that try to be disinterested, that try to do the right thing, even if it may not be the most profitable thing, um, the, the, the professions are really in extremis. And both my discussion of truth and my discussion of goodness really address this issue in the 21st century. Beauty is a separate question. I wondered about that. I wondered whether, seriously, whether this book was, as I say, an antidote to those awful, awful feelings you must have uh, gotten from the responses to your Harvard inquiry. Well, let's be specific. Um, truth is being attacked in two ways. On the one hand, there is the postmodern critique, which says, who decides what's true? It's just a question of power. You know, whoever con controls the microphone, whoever controls the press, they determine what's truth. On the other hand, there are the new digital media, uh, the internet, the web, things like Wikipedia, where anything can be put forth, whether or not it has truth, truthiness, or complete falsity. And this makes the establishment of truth very, very difficult. So I went back to the professions and to the disciplines, to the academic disciplines, and I came up with the conclusion that the best antidote to the attack on truth is understanding the methods that expert people use to determine the truth. Such as? What, does, what do scientists do to figure out what's really going on as opposed to false positives? What do historians do to figure out what really happened? And so on. That's from the point of view of disciplines. And then when we go to the professions is what I call practical truth. A journalist isn't just somebody who asks one person one question and writes it up or sits in his or her office and says, what would it be? The good journalist, the journalist who is well-trained 
asks many people questions, doesn't go off the record unless it's absolutely essential, um, is willing to confront somebody who's critical and say, I'm going to publish this tomorrow, what's your reaction? And those practical truths are equally important. So if you said to me as a teacher or as a parent, how can I help young people today or people of any age establish what's true, I say you have to understand the methods that human beings have developed over hundreds if not thousands of years of separating the truth from the chaff. And I think it can be done. Indeed, I'd even go further, Dick. I think at this point in human history, if you're willing to work at it, if you're willing to be skeptical without being cynical, the chances of establishing what's really true are greater than ever before. I think you and I have talked about this before. 30, 40 years ago, there were three networks. Walter Cronkite would tell us that's the way it is, and then Eric Severide would explain the reason. And this, I think, uh, made many people feel good. But in fact, you know, lots of things they said didn't have as much authentication as is needed. And now, if you're willing to, to take the effort of looking at many, many different sources and evaluating them, the chances that you can really figure out things are greater. Now, you probably ask me, how many people bothered to do that? I, I will <laughs> ask you, how many people bothered to do that? And I guess my answer is not enough. Um, we're well aware in studying the digital media what are called echo effects or mirror effects or the big sort, where people basically pay attention to those sources, those blogs, those um, websites, which are in agreement with their own judgments or prejudices while ignoring those which challenge them. That's, that's not a good situation. Um, I often say I particularly value what happens Friday at 5 o'clock on National Public Radio when David Brooks and E.J. Dionne discuss what's happened this week. They don't agree, but they do it in a civil way. I think that's the kind of um, opportunity which the digital media provide, but not if you're only going to turn on Fox or MSNBC, which make no effort to really get the story right. But Howard, uh, you write a new volume, a beautiful new volume, a good new volume, a truthful new volume, truth, beauty, and goodness reframed. What do you mean reframed? You say your, your subtitle, Educating for the Virtues in the 21st Century, you're, you're saying that this is a temporal thing. Let me, let me give you the background. Um, I started as a psychologist and um, was interested in how the mind works. And what surprised me, particularly with reference to my work on intelligence, was that it was educators who really glommed on to my work. And I hadn't been trained particularly as an educator, but about 15 years ago, I sat down with myself and said, what do I see as the purpose of education? I wrote a book called The Disciplined Mind. We may have discussed it the, we did in the, uh, the late 1990s. And I stated there a position which I believed in, but which I now realize was quite naive. I said the purpose of education is to help people understand what's true and what's not, what's beautiful and what's not, what's good and what's not. And I guess I took the man in the street, the woman in the street view that it was kind of obvious what's true, et cetera. But then two things happened. On the one hand, I would give academic colloquia, and people of a relativist or postmodern perspective would say, how dare you say that you know what's true or beautiful or good? It's just a question of you know, whoever has the, has the hegemony. And then I began to observe my children and other young people and began to um, play around with the digital media myself. And I realized that the terrain was totally different than it was in the 1980s and early 90s, because anything could be posted, anything could be changed, anything could be morphed. The digital media are a wild west. There are no ethics there that uh, anybody understands. And so I said, look, Howard, either you, you address yourself that's, that's familiarly. How, that's, that's how I work. Um, I said, look, either you can throw truth, beauty, and goodness away altogether, which I refuse to do, and none of us could live if we really threw them away, if we really didn't have any belief in anything. Or you can assume they're totally obvious, or they're God-given, or they're from the Ten Commandments, or they're in uh, logical equations. Or you can say, how do we think about these things nowadays? And what I would say if I was trying to justify the book, I think I've raised a question which every serious person has to address. Namely, what's left of truth, beauty, and goodness in the 21st century? And if you don't want to scuttle them all together, how do you think about them as well as you possibly can? And I don't think I've got the answer completely correct, but I'm willing to say I think I've probably gotten closer to the answer than anybody else. And I hope people who doubt that will read the book and argue with me and uh, tell me how I've gotten it wrong. Well, I've read the book, and I have the feeling 
uh, uh, beauty here is in italics. And I had the thought when I finished the book and I turned back and realized that, that it was quite appropriate because it's something aside and that when you deal with truth and goodness, they're different. Why did you, uh, or are you going to tell me you had nothing to do with the cover of the book? <laughs> I certainly had a lot to do with the title of the book. Um, beauty actually is the most wonderful story. It's the one for which I think there are no negatives. There may have been an earlier time where there was a canon and everything was judged about whether it had the right ratios and whether it was photographic or realistic. That is gone. That is over. We now live in a situation where you can have access to any work of art ever created, whether it's visual, musical, performance. Um, you can even interact. You can create things. And there's no reason in the world why you can't develop your own sense of beauty. And the analogy is food. Um, if you lived among the bongo bongo and you only ate what they did, you, know, you didn't have any real variety. But now anybody with, who lives in any kind of a, a modern country is exposed to many different cuisines. There's no reason to think that what you value to 10 or 20 is what you have to value for the rest of your life. Um, and you don't impinge on anybody else's uh, sense of security by developing your own palate. In fact, it's wonderful. I think it's exactly the same situation with works of art. We can continue throughout our lives to develop our own aesthetic sense. We can determine what we consider as beautiful and why. It doesn't impinge on anybody else. But let me make two further points. One, I think this is most likely to happen if you develop what I call a portfolio, a personal portfolio which traces your own changing tastes over time. And I impose myself on the reader by showing how my taste has changed enormously over the last uh, 50 years. In fact, the book is, is, is dedicated to the uh, Museum of Modern Art, mm -hmm. where uh, a lot of my eyes were, were, open, were open, so to speak. Um, and the other thing is that there is no reason in the world to challenge somebody's sense of beauty unless they can't see the difference or hear the difference between things. In other words, if your sense of beauty is only because it was done by Cezanne and you can see no difference between Cezanne and Paisan and other people, then I don't take your sense of beauty seriously. It's no different than, Dick, if you said, well, this wine is so much better than that wine and I blindfolded you and you couldn't taste the difference. And then, then it really is a, it's a judgment without basis. Um, but I think nobody wants to fool himself or herself. And our taste should be based on discriminations we can make in our own work and the works of other people. So beauty is a great story because there's no villain. But uh, because there's no villain, uh, I guess I felt it was a less compelling story than truth and goodness on which so much count. Except as I say in the book, and this may be just me, I don't want to put words in your mouth. It might be about food. You and I have broken bread together. For many of us, what's most important in our lives, other than our family, is the chance to be involved with art. Um, for me, it, it makes an enormous difference. I mean, I played the piano for many years. I was pretty good at one time. Um, I go to concerts, plays, um, museums, wherever, whenever I can. And it's what gives meaning to my life. And um, I have more agency over beauty than over anything else. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. Now we come to it, yeah. right? I but mean, I don't think people have put it quite that way. Um, in fact, as you know, many aestheticians threw out the word beauty altogether. Um, and I think that's a mistake because I think there are things which I say in the book are interesting, um, memorable in form, worthy of revisiting, and make us feel good. And that's what I want to use the word beauty for. But again, you could be Elliot Carter fan, you could be a Stephen Sondheim fan, you could be a rapper fan, and that's absolutely fine. But when you say it's less important, maybe in the sense of what happens to the world, it's less important. But I don't think it's less important for what happens to human beings in our, as it were, emotional, spiritual, and cognitive lives. You see, that's the feeling I had as I read the book. You'd, um, although truth and goodness are here and very much here in the, uh, in the book, uh, it's easy. Or you use the word agency. You don't have agency over truth and goodness. You do over beauty because it is so personal. That's right. But maybe, and I didn't do this in the book, in beauty I focus on art because that's what's important mm -hmm. to me. But it, I could have focused on nature, which probably historically and prehistorically has been more important to people. I could also talk about human relations and people whom we value. Uh, we could think about 
our relationships with people, not in the sense of whether they're good or bad, but in the sense of do we want to be with them. Um, and so this is, I guess this is kind of an accordion. I use as my central example the arts, but what I call beauty could relate, could relate I mean, why do people love cities? And many of them do. Why go of beauty? Well, w w walking down Fifth Avenue um, in the uh, first week of May, when the was, weather was really nice here, I've never seen it so crowded in my life. It just people, it was like they'd been pouring out uh, after a winter of our discontent. And uh, I think for many people, it's probably a beautiful experience, even though it wasn't something you're going to hang up in, in a museum. So all I'm saying is I think from the point of view of um, our experience, beauty is very important. In fact, I have a little formula in the book. Truth is about propositions, statements. Goodness is about relationships among people. Beauty is about experience. And certainly you wouldn't argue experience isn't important. No, not at all. But again, it comes back to this question of agency. And I, I was so um, uh, taken with uh, you're saying, when I examine my own motivations for writing the present book, I realize that I have been stimulated in significant measure by the need to respond to two powerful analyses of the human condition, one emanating from biology, the other from economics. And that's your anti-determinist concept, because you want agency. Those are my villains. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, the book is not a all points attack on evolutionary psychology or on rational choice economics. But it is a statement that every, every era has its predominant analytic frameworks. You know, maybe it was Marxism at one time, maybe it was um, you know, the French Revolution, liberty, equality, uh, uh, and fraternity. The, the, the dominant narratives now, and this does come out in the sense of, the, of our work in the professions, is the way we are the way we are because of our evolution and we may as well like it. And in the end, the systems of human relations works the, work the best when everybody is just a rational agent doing what helps him or herself and then markets will bring equilibrium to the society. Well, having lived through uh, you know, more, th more than enough economic chaos just in the last decade, it's quite clear that markets have no internal genius to them. And having lived through a period where people's selfishness is very, very damaging, I don't at all believe that you know, people acting in their own self-interest is the best way to go. So I'm saying, wait a second for about economics. And coming out of psychology myself, certainly I understand that there are certain things, particularly having to do with the relationship among sexes and probably child rearing as well, where there are evolutionary reasons for the way that we are. But when it comes to explaining truth or beauty or goodness, I don't think that evolution gives us much uh, purchase at all. In fact, I have a long passage in the chapter on beauty where I attack viciously the notion of neuroaesthetics, neuro namely the sense that if we know about the nervous system, it can explain what it is that we like in art. The most it can explain is the most primitive forms of kitsch. And anybody looking at the 20th century, even if you knew every, what every neuron was doing, could never predict Picasso or Andy Warhol or Mark Rothko, could never predict Stavinsky or the Beatles or rap. So the notion that somehow the works of art that we produce, or indeed the works of mind that we produce, are dictated by either our nervous system or by genetics, that's only true in a completely tautological sense. Tautological meaning we couldn't do it if we didn't have a brain and we didn't have genes. But uh, a wonderful example, which actually comes from Alan Wolf, was the, the uh, political scientist, was in the 1960s, huge changes occurred in America. There was the civil rights movement, there was the um, women's movement, and there were changes which were still taking place in how we think about sexuality. There is nothing, nothing in either evolutionary psychology or rational choice economics which can give you any kind of purchase on that. And in the very end of the book, I talk about how human beings matter. I happen to think that Gandhi was the most important human being of the last thousand years. I didn't understand that. Explain it to us. Okay, but let, let, let me just say, there's no way anybody could ever have predicted a Gandhi or made, made him happen. You know, this was a guy who was born in India in 1860-something, and he came from a family with some political uh, 
knowledge. He went to England, became a dandy, uh, you know, dressed to the T, um, fooled around with all sorts of vegetarian and spiritual things, then went to South Africa, was thrown off a train, and that's when it all started. Why do I think Gandhi is the most important person of the millennium? And I say millennium because I don't want to step on Christ's toes, um, because Gandhi realized that in this world we're not going to survive unless we can disagree and dispute without killing one another. And going beyond Christ's turn the other cheek, he actually worked out what my teacher called an algebra of how you can protest. And the influence he had in India, we could debate about. But the influence he had in America in the civil rights movement, in South Africa with Nelson Mandela, in China with Tiananmen, and now with the Middle Eastern Spring, where Tahrir Square in Egypt, people are standing there without guns. This is Gandhi. Um, but it'll take long before everybody who's watching this program is dead to know whether Gandhi's message has been, uh, has been heard. But I really do think that, uh, as, as Einstein said of Gandhi, it will be difficult for people to believe that a man like this could have walked the earth. And this doesn't mean that he was a saint in every way. I could give you pathography of Gandhi, which would take the rest of the show. But what we learn from people is that they all have flaws, but what they are at their best are the things which can inspire us. And I've already listed the inspiration that Gandhi had, which dwarfs the inspiration of any other figure in the last millennia. Howard, uh, going back to your title, you chose it, Educating for the Virtues in the 21st Century. Um, that's, a, that's a strange um, way of putting. I, I think it's, 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 it puzzles me. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what does it show, what does it tell about my friend Howard Gardner? Where is he today? Uh, that you see them and you want to educate us for him? for them? I don't think so. You see something about the 21st century. Well, I think what there, is it? I think there are two points. One of the points which I actually like in the book is education is no longer for the first 20 years of life. It's a lifelong project, and here you, are, you and I are, in, in our elder years, continuing to probe for these things. We don't say, well, I figured truth out, or I'm not going to look at art anymore, or you know, there are no more ethical conflicts. It's a lifelong project. And the portfolio that I described in the arts is matched by what I call an understanding of method with respect to truth and what I call a commons with respect to ethics. And the commons is where we discuss the, the ethical issues that come up all the time, which the Bible doesn't tell us how to handle and the, and the golden rule doesn't tell us how to handle. Do you publish bin Laden's photograph? There's no end. You can't open the Bible and figure it out. These are ongoing discussions, but what I believe in, if we have a commons where they can be discussed, um, this is where our insights come. So that's the first thing, is this is a lifelong um, enterprise. The second thing is that um, the digital revolution which affects all of us was something which couldn't have been anticipated in the middle of the 20th century. And it really does, its shadow is everywhere. I think ultimately it will be seen as important as the inventive writing and the invention of printing. But whereas it took centuries to see the effects of those, now all we have to do is look at digital natives, kids who are 20 or under, to see that they just process the world and think about the world very differently than those of us who are digital immigrants. And a wonderful thing which I talk about in the book is this is a place where young and old can really work together because presumably old have some kind of experience, some kind of wisdom, which is not useless, but handling the technologies, understanding information, the way it's transmitted, being inside social networks are things which are so much in the fingertips of the digital natives that we cannot, we cannot assume that we understand them as well and can do them as well. So it's a wonderful cooperative project, and I think it might give help to both ends of the age spectrum. So you see, you see the digital age as creating the commons or recreating the commons? Well, in one sense, yes, it already exists because of the fact that anybody can connect to anyone else on anything. But as I said earlier, it's only a commons if we choose to take it. If we go in our own silo and only interact with people who just think the way we do, then it's a pseudo well, commons. What have we done? I mean, we're far enough along. Uh, both in the 21st century and in the digital age, for you to make a guess as to what we've done, what we're likely to do. 
Okay, um, you put me on the spot, so I'll give I you mean the best, to. I the mean best to. answer I give. I think that for the people who are willing to work hard at it, the people who are really trying to, as it were, interrogate sources um, and willing to reflect deeply on ethical issues, the chances of getting it right, of reframing it appropriately, is, are greater than ever. If you look at the vast population, from everything I know, the issues are not very vivid yet in their minds. Most of the use of the digital media is social networking. It's uh, exchanging information on Facebook and other kinds of, uh, of, of social networks. Um, or it's involved with uh, multi-user kinds of games, um, not so much with virtual realities. And I would say that uh, much of the use now is not, not particularly um, virtuous. Um, whether it's um, malevolent, I think in most cases, no. I mean, we do know about bullying and cyberbullying and sexting and things like that, and those are things which need to be addressed. We do know about people illegally downloading, and that's a very difficult kind of issue to address. But I would say that here's, here's, the, here's the good news. There are positive examples with reference to truth, beauty, and goodness ushered in or at least amplified by the digital media, but we have to pay attention to those and try to learn from them. The example I used of, of David Brooks and uh, E.J. Dionne happens to be in the radio, but, D, but, e, but um, David Brooks also engaged with, with blogging regularly with Gail Collins. And again, these people don't agree about things, but it's a commons. Um, I'm hoping at, at my university to develop a commons on the basis uh, about ethical issues, and I'll tell you why. In all major universities that I know now, the people who run them refuse to talk about any kind of um, faux pas that anybody in the faculty does. It's mums the word, but probably because they're afraid of legal action. So what you then have are blogs where people anonymously say all sorts of things where there's no particular truth value, and it's very hard to figure out what's going on. I think we need to have a commons where people will state their names and their beliefs and be willing to argue civilly with one another. And, and that kind of thing can be very, very productive. And that's the point at which I have to say goodbye, Howard Gardner. Thank you so much for joining me today and telling the audience, my goodness, buy truth, buy beauty, and goodness reframed, your wonderful book. Thank you. Great to talk with you. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other Open Mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash openmind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.